Chapter Twelve of Farewell to Nicola by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve. As may be supposed, my meeting with the Don afforded me abundant food for reflection. Was it true, as he had said, that in his hour of distress Nicola had afforded him an asylum? And if so, why was the latter doing so? I knew Nicola too well by this time to doubt that he had some good and sufficient reason for his action. Lurking at the back of my mind was a hideous suspicion that, although I tried my hardest not to think of it, would not allow itself to be banished altogether. I could not but remember the story Nicola had told me on that eventful evening concerning his early life, and the chance remark he had let fall one day that he knew more about the man Don Martinez than I supposed. I only tended to confirm it. If that were so, and he still cherished as I had not the least doubt he did, for Nicola was one who never forgave or forgot the same undying hatred and desire for vengeance, against his old enemy, the son of his mother's betrayer, then there was, but here I was compelled to stop. I could not go on. The death-like face of the man I had just left rose before my mind's eye like an accusing angel. Whereupon I made a resolution that I would think no more of him, nor would I say anything to any member of our party concerning my meeting with him that afternoon. It is superfluous to remark that the latter resolve was more easily kept than the former. The first dinner in Venice after our return was far from being a success. Miss Gertrude's headache, instead of leaving her, had become so bad she was compelled to go forthwith to bed, leaving Glenbarth in despair and the rest of our party as low-spirited as possible. Next morning she declared she was a little better, though she complained of having passed a wretched night. I had such horrible dreams, she told my wife and when I woke up I scarcely dared close my eyes again. I cannot remember quite what it was she said she dreamt, said Phyllis, when she had told me the story, but I know it had something to do with Dr. Nicola and his dreadful house, and that it frightened her terribly. The girl certainly looked pale and haggard, but not a bit like the happy creature who had stepped into the train at Rome. Heaven grant that there is not more trouble ahead, I said to myself as I smoked my pipe and thought over the matter. I'm beginning to wish we had not come to Venice at all. In that case we should not have seen Dr. Nicola, nor the Don. Miss Trevor would not have been in this state, and I should not have been haunted day and night with this horrible suspicion of foul play. It was no use, however, talking of what might or might not have happened. It was sufficient that the things I have narrated had come to pass, and I must endeavour to derive what satisfaction I could from the reflection that I had done all that was possible under the circumstances. On the day following our return to Venice, the Dean of Bedminster set off for England. I fancy he was sorry to go, but of one thing I'm quite sure, and that was we regretted losing him. It was arranged that as soon as we returned to England, we should pay him a visit at Bedminster, and the Duke should accompany us. Transparently honest though he was in all his things, I fancied the old man had a touch of vanity in his composition, and I could quite understand that he would be anxious to show off his future son-in-law before the society of his quiet cathedral town. On the night following his departure, I had the most terrible dream I have had in my life, though some time has elapsed since then, I can still recall the fright it gave me. My wife declares that she could see the effect of it upon my face for more than a day afterwards. But this, I think, is going a little too far. I am willing, however, to admit that it made a very great impression upon me at the time, the more so for the reason that it touched my thought, and I was quite at a loss to understand it. It was night, I remember, and I just entered the Palace of Levici. I must have been invisible, for though I stood in the room with Nicola, he did not appear to be aware of my presence. As usual, he was at work upon some of his chemical experiments. And I looked at his face and saw that it wore an expression I had never seen there before. I can describe it best by saying that it was one of absolute cruelty, unrelieved by even the smallest gleam of pity, and yet it was not cruelty in the accepted meaning of the word, so much as an overwhelming desire to punish and avenge. I am quite aware on reading over what I have just written that my inability to convey the exact impression renders my meaning obscure. Yet I can do no more. 
it was a look beyond the power of my pen to describe presently he put down the glass he held in his hand and looked up with his head a little to one side as if he were listening for some sound in the adjoining room there was a shuffling footstep in the corridor outside and then the door opened and there entered a figure so awful that i shrank back from it appalled it was don martinez and yet it was not the don the face and the height were perhaps the same but the man himself was oh so different on seeing nicola he shambled forward rather than walked and dropped in a heat at his feet clutching his knees and making a feeble whining noise not unlike that of an animal in pain get up said nicola sternly and as he said it he pointed to a couch on the further side of the room the man went and stretched himself out upon it as if in obedience to some unspoken command nicola followed him and having exposed the other's chest took from the table what looked like a hypodermic syringe filled it from one of the graduated glasses upon the table and injected the contents beneath the man's prostrate skin an immediate and violent fit of trembling was the result followed by awful contortions of the face and suddenly he stiffened himself out and lay like one dead taking his watch from his pocket nicola made a careful note of the time so vivid was my dream that i can even remember hearing the ticking of the watch minute after minute went by until at last the don opened his eyes then i realized that the man was no longer a human being but an animal he uttered horrible noises in his throat that were not unlike the short sharp bark of a wolf and when nicola bade him move he crawled upon the floor like a dog after that he retreated to a corner where he crouched and glowered upon his master as if he were prepared at any moment to spring upon him and drag him down as one throws a bone to a dog so did nicola toss him food he devoured it ravenously as would a starving cur there was foam at the corners of his mouth and the light of madness in his eyes nicola returned to the table and began to pour some liquid into a glass so busily occupied was he that he did not see the thing cannot call it a man in the corner get on to his feet he had taken up a small tube and was stirring the contents of the glass with it when the other was less than a couple of feet from him i tried to warn him of his danger only to find that i could not utter a word then the object turned upon him and clawed at his throat he turned and a moment later the madman was lying whining feebly upon the floor and nicola was wiping the blood from a scratch on his left hand side of his throat the moment i awoke to find myself sitting up in bed with the perspiration streaming down my face i have had such an awful dream i said in answer to my wife's startled inquiry as to what was the matter i don't know that i've ever been so frightened before you are trembling now said my wife try not to think of it dear remember it was only a dream that it was something more than a mere dream i felt certain it was so complete and dovetailed so exactly with my horrible suspicions that i could not altogether consign it to the realms of fancy fearing a repetition if i attempted to go to sleep again i switched on the electric light and endeavoured to interest myself in a book but it was of no use the face of the poor brute i had seen crouching in the corner haunted me continually and would not be dispelled never in my life before i had been so thankful to see the dawn at breakfast my wife commented upon my dream miss trevor however said nothing I became quieter and more distracted every day towards evening glenbarth spoke to me concerning her i don't know what to make of it all he said anxiously she assures me that she's perfectly well and happy but seeing the condition she is in i can scarcely believe that it is as much as i can do to get a word out of her if i didn't know that she loves me i should begin to imagine that she regretted having promised to be my wife i don't think you need to be afraid of that i answered one only has to look at her face to see how deeply attached she is to you the truth of the whole matter is my dear fellow i've come to the conclusion that we have had enough of venice nicola is at the bottom of our troubles and the sooner we see the last of him the better it will be for all parties concerned hear hear to that he answered fervently deeply grateful though i am to him for what he did when gertrude was ill i can honestly say that i never want to see him again at luncheon that day i accordingly broached the subject of our return to england it was received by my wife and the duke with unfeigned satisfaction and by miss trevor with what appeared to be approval 
It struck me, however, that she did not seem so anxious to leave as I expected she would be. This somewhat puzzled me, but I was not destined to remain very long in ignorance of the reason. That afternoon I happened to be left alone with her for some little time. We talked for a while on a variety of topics, but I could see all the time that there was something she was desirous of saying to me, though she could not quite make up her mind on how to commence. At last she rose, and crossing the room, took a chair by my side. Sir Richard, I'm going to ask a favour of you, she said with a faraway look in her eyes. Let me assure you that it is granted before you ask it, I replied. Will you tell me what it is? It may appear strange to you, she said, but I have a conviction, absurd, superstitious, or whatever you may term it, that some great misfortune will befall me if I leave Venice just yet. I am not my own mistress and must stay. I want you to arrange it. This was a nice sort of shell to have dropped into one's camp, particularly at such a time and under such circumstances, and I scarcely knew what reply to make. What possible misfortune could befall you? I asked. I cannot say, she replied. I am only certain that I must remain for a little while longer. You can have no idea what I have suffered lately. Bear with me, Sir Richard. Here she lifted a face of piteous entreaty to me, which I was powerless to resist, adding, I implore you not to be angry with me. Is it likely that I should be angry with you, Miss Gertrude? I replied. Why should I be? If you really desire to remain for a little longer, there is nothing to prevent it. But you must not allow yourself to become ill again. Believe me, it is only your imagination that is playing tricks with you. Ah, you do not know everything, she answered. Every night I have such terrible dreams that I have come to dread going to bed. I thought of my own dream on the previous night and could well understand how she felt. After her last remark she was silent for some moments. That there was something still to come I could see. But what it was I had no more idea than a child. At last she spoke. Sir Richard, she said, would you mind very much if I were to ask you a most important question? I scarcely like to do so, but I know that you are my friend and that you will give me good advice. I will endeavour to do so, I replied. What is the question you wish to ask me? It's about my engagement, she replied. You know how good and unselfish the Duke is and how truly he believes in me. I could not bear to bring trouble upon him. But in love there should be no secrets. Nothing should be hidden from the other. Yet I feel I am hiding so much. Can you understand what I mean? In a great measure, I answered. But I should like you to do so thoroughly. Miss Gertrude, if I may hazard a guess, I should say that you've been dreaming about Dr. Nicola again. Yes, she answered after a moment's hesitation. Absurd though it may be, I can think of no one else. He weighs upon my spirits like lead. And yet I know that I should be grateful to him for all he did to me when I was so ill. But for him I should not be alive now. I'm afraid that you've been allowing the thought of your recent danger to lie too heavily upon your mind, I continued. Remember that this is the 19th century, and there are no such things as you think Nicola would have you believe. But when I know that there are, she asked, looking at me reproachfully. Ah, Sir Richard, she continued, if you knew all that I do, you would pity me. But no one will ever know, and I cannot tell them. But one thing is quite certain, I must stay in Venice for the present, happen what may. Something tells me so, day and night, and when I think of the Duke, my heart well nigh breaks, for I fear I should bring trouble upon him. I did my best to comfort her, promised that if she really desired to remain in Venice, I would arrange it for her, and by doing so committed myself to a policy that I very well knew. When I came to consider it later, it was not expedient and very far from being judicious. Regarded seriously in a sober commonplace light, the whole affair seems too absurd, and yet at the same time nothing could possibly have been of more real or earnest. When she had heard me out, she thanked me very prettily for the interest I had taken, and then, with a little sigh that went to my heart, left the room. Later in the afternoon I broke the news to my wife and told her of the promise I had given Gertrude. But what does it all mean, Dick? she asked, looking at me with startled eyes. What is it she fears will happen if she goes away from Venice? That is what I cannot get her to say, I replied. Indeed, I am not altogether certain that she knows herself. It's a most perplexing business, and I wish to goodness I had never had anything to do with it. The better plan, I think, would be to humour her, to keep her as cheerful as we can, 
and when the proper time arrives get her away from venice and home to england as quickly as we can my wife agreed with me on this point and our course of action was thereupon settled later in the afternoon i made a resolution my own suspicions concerning the wretched martinos were growing so intolerable that i could bear them no longer the memory of the dream i had had on the previous night was never absent from my thoughts and i felt that unless i could set matters right once and for all and convince myself they were not as i suspected with anstruther's friend i should be unable to close my eyes when i next went to bed for this reason i determined to set off to the palace of Ravici at once to have an interview with nikola in the hope of being able to extort some information from him perhaps after all i argued i am worrying myself unnecessarily there may be no connection between martinos and that south american i determined however to set the matter at rest that afternoon accordingly at four o'clock i made an excuse and departed for the rio di consiglio it was a dark cloudy afternoon and the house as i approached it looked drearier if such a thing were possible than i had ever seen it i disembarked from my gondola at the steps and having bade the man wait for me which he did on the other side of the street i rang the bell the same old servant whom i had remembered having seen on previous occasions answered it and informed me that his master was not at home but that he expected him every minute i determined to wait for him and ascended the stairs to his room the windows were open and where i stood i could watch the gondolier placidly eating his bread and onions on the other side of the street as far as i could see there was no change in the room itself the centre table was as usual littered with papers and books that near the window was covered with chemical apparatus while the old black cat was fast asleep upon the couch on the other side the oriental rug described in another place covered the ominous trap door so that no portion of it could be seen i was still standing at the window looking down upon the canal below when the door at the further end softly opened and a face looked in at me good heavens i can even now feel the horror which swept over me it was the countenance of don martinez but so changed even from that what it had been when i had seen him in the rio del baccaroli that i scarcely recognised it it was like the face of an animal and of a madman if such a thing could be combined he looked at me and then withdrew closing the door behind him only to reopen it a few moments later having apparently made sure that i was alone he crept in and crossing the room approached me for a moment i was at a loss how to act i was not afraid that the poor wretch might do me any mischief that my whole being shrank from him with a physical revulsion beyond all description in words i can understand now something of the dislike my wife and the duke declared they entertained for him on tiptoe with his finger to his lips as if to enjoin silence he crept towards me muttering something in spanish that i could not understand and then in english he continued hush senor can you not see them he pointed his hand in various directions as if he could see the figures of men and women moving about the apartment once he bowed low as if to some imaginary dignitary drawing back at the same time as if to permit him to pass and turning to me he continued do you know who that is no that i will tell you senor that is the most noble admiral ravici the owner of this house then for a short time he stood silent picking feebly at his fingers and regarding me and ever and on from the corner of his eye suddenly there was a sharp quick step in the corridor outside the handle of the door turned and nikola entered the room as his glance fell upon the wretched being at my side a look not unlike that i had seen in my dream flashed into his countenance it was gone again however as suddenly as it had come and he was advancing to greet me with all his old politeness it was then that the folly of my errand was borne in upon me even if my suspicions were correct what could i do and what chance could I hope to have of being able to induce Nicola to confide in me? Meanwhile, he had pointed at the door, and Martinos, trembling in every limb, was slinking towards it like a whipped hound. And at that moment, I made a discovery that I confess came near to depriving me of my presence of mind altogether. You can judge of its value for yourself when I say, and extending to the lobe of Nicola's left ear, halfway down and across his throat, was a newly made scar just such a one in fact as would be made by a hand with sharp fingernails clutching at it could my dream have been true after all i cannot tell you how delighted i am to see you my dear sir richard said nicola as he seated himself 
I understood that you had returned to Venice. Having outgrown the desire to learn how Nicola had become aware of anything, I merely agreed that we had returned and took the chair he offered me. When all the circumstances are taken into consideration, I really think that that moment was certainly the most embarrassing of my life. Nicola's eyes were fixed steadily upon mine, and I could see in them what was almost an expression of malicious amusement. As usually was making capital out of my awkwardness, and as I knew that I could do no good, I felt that there was nothing for it but for me to submit. Then the miserable Spaniard's face rose before my mind's eye, and I felt that I could not abandon him without an effort to what I knew would be his fate. Nicola brought me up to the mark even quicker than I expected. It's very plain, he said, with a satirical smile, playing around his thin lips, that you have come with the intention of saying something important to me. What is it? At this I rose from my chair and went across the room where he was sitting. Placing my hand upon his shoulder, I looked down into his face, took courage and began. Dear Nicola, I said, you and I have known each other for many years now. We've seen some strange things together, one of us perhaps less willingly than the other. But venture to think, however, that we have never stood on a stranger or more dangerous ground than we do tonight. I am afraid I am scarcely able to follow your meaning, he replied. I knew that this was not the case. But I was equally convinced that to argue the question with him would be worse than useless. Do you remember the night on which you told me that story concerning the woman who lived in this house, who was betrayed by the Spaniard and who died on that Spanish island? I asked. He rose hurriedly from his chair and went to the window. I heard him catch his breath, and I knew that I had moved him at last. What of it? he inquired, turning upon me sharply as he spoke. Only that I have come to see you concerning the denouement of that story, I was answered. I have come because I cannot possibly stay away. You have no idea how deeply I have been thinking over this matter. Do you think I cannot see through it and read between the lines? You told it to me because in some inscrutable fashion of your own, you had become aware that Don Martinez would bring a letter of introduction to me from my friend Dan Struther. Remember, it was I who introduced him to you. Do you think that I did not notice the expression that came to your face whenever you looked at him? Later, my suspicions were aroused. Don was a Spaniard, he was rich, and he had made the mistake of admitting that while he had been in Chile, he had never been in Equinata. You persuaded me to bring him to this house, and here you obtained your first influence over him. My dear Hatteras, said Nicola, you are presupposing a great deal. You get beyond my depth. Don't you think it would be wiser if you were to stick to plain facts? My suppositions are stronger than my facts, I answered. You laid yourself out to meet him, and your influence over him became greater every day. It could be seen in his face. He was fascinated and could not escape. Then he began to gamble and found his money slipping through his fingers like water through a sieve. You have come to the conclusion then, and I am responsible for that also. I did not say that it was your doing exactly, I said, gathering courage from the calmness of his manner and the attention he was giving me. But it fits in too well with the whole scheme to free you entirely from responsibility. Then look at the change that began to come over the man himself. His faculties were leaving him one by one, being wiped out, just as a schoolboy wipes his lesson from a slate. If he'd been an old man, I should have said that it was the commencement of his second childhood. But he's still a comparatively young man. Do you forget that while he'd been gambling, he'd also been drinking heavily? May not debauchery tell its own tale? It is not debauchery that has brought about this terrible change. Who knows that better than yourself? After the duel which you had providentially prevented, we went to Rome for a fortnight. On the afternoon of our return, I met him near the telegraph office. At first glance, I scarcely recognised him. So terrible was the change in his appearance. If ever a poor wretch was on the verge of idiocy, he was that one. Or ever he informed me he was living with you, why should the fact that he was so doing produce such a result? I cannot say. I dare not try to understand it, but for pity's sake, Nicola, by all that you hold dear, I implore you to solve the riddle. Last night I had a dream. You are perhaps a believer in dreams, he remarked very quietly, as if the question scarcely interested him. This dream was of a description such as I have never had in my life before, I answered, disregarding the sneer and then told it to him, increasing rather than lessening the abominable details. He heard me out without moving a muscle of his face, and it was only when I had reached the climax and paused that he spoke. This is a strange rigmarole, you tell me, he said. Fortunately, you confess that it was only a dream. 
Dr. Nicola, I cried, it was more than a dream. To prove it, let me ask you how you received that long scratch that shows upon your neck and throat. I pointed my finger at it, but Nicola returned my gaze, still without a flicker of his eyelids. What if I do admit it, he began. What if your dream were correct? What difference would it make? I looked at him in amazement. To tell the truth, I was more astonished by his admission of the correctness of my suspicions than I should have been had he denied them altogether. As it was, I was too much overcome to be able to answer him for a few moments. Come, he said, answer my question. What if I do admit the truth of all you say? You confess, then, that the whole business has been one long scheme to entrap this wretched man and to get him into your power. Tis, he answered, still keeping his eyes fixed upon me. You see, I am candid. Go on. My brain began to reel under the strain placed upon it. Since he had owned to it, what was I to do? What could I say? Sir Richard Hatteras, said Nicola, approaching a little nearer to me, resting one hand upon the table and speaking very impressively. I wonder if it has struck you that you are a brave man to come to me today and say this to me. In the whole circle of the men I know, I may declare with truth that I am not aware of one other who would do so much. What is this man to you that you should befriend him? He would have robbed you of your dearest friend without a second thought, as he would rob you of your wife if the idea occurred to him. He is without the bowels of compassion. The blood of thousands stain his hands and cries out for vengeance. He is a fugitive from justice, a thief, a liar, and a traitor to the country he swore to govern as an honest man. On a certain little island on the other side of the world there is a lonely churchyard, and in that churchyard a still lonelier grave. In it lies the body of a woman, my mother. In this very room that woman was betrayed by his father, so in this room also shall that betrayal be avenged. I have waited all my life. The opportunity has been long in coming. Now, however, it has arrived, and I am decreed by fate to be the instrument of vengeance. I am a tall man, but as he said this, Nicola seemed to tower over me. His face set hard as a rock, his eyes blazing like living coals, and his voice trembling under the influence of his passion. Little by little I was growing to think as he did, and to look upon Martinos as he saw him. But this cannot go on, I repeated, in a last feeble protest against the horror of the thing. Surely you could not find it in your heart to treat a fellow creature so. He is no fellow creature of yours or mine, Nicola retorted sternly, as if he were rebuking a childish mistake. Would you call the man who had shot down those innocent young men of Equitina before their mother's eyes a fellow creature? Is it possible that the son of a man who so cruelly wronged and betrayed the trusting woman he first saw in this room, who led her across the seas to desert her and send her to a grave, could be called a man? I'll give you one more instance of his barbarity. And so saying, he threw off the black velvet coat he was wearing, and drawing up his right shirt sleeve, bade me examine his arm. I saw that from the shoulder to the elbow it was covered with scars of old wounds, strange white marks in pairs, and each about half an inch long. These scars, he went on, were made by his orders, and with hot pincers, when I was a boy, and as his negro servants made them, he laughed and taunted me with my mother's shame. No, no, this is no man, rather a dangerous animal that were best out of the way. It has been told to me that you and I shall only meet twice more. Let these meetings lead you to think better of me. The time is not far distant when I must leave the world. When that hour arrives, there is a lonely monastery in a range of eastern mountains upon which no Englishman has ever set his foot. Of that monastery I shall become an inmate. No one outside its walls will ever look upon my face again. There I shall work out my destiny, and, if I have sinned, be sure I shall receive my punishment at those hands that alone can bestow it. Now leave me. God help me for the coward I am. But the fact remains that I left him without another word. End of chapter 12